Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirit went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000 of them. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Verse 14, so those who fed the swine uh, fled and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told him, told them how it happened to him, who had been demon possessed, and about the swine. Then they began to plead with Jesus to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with Jesus. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion over you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Amen? So this is an amazing scripture portion where we see Jesus casting out a demon because a man was possessed by the legion. Now I want to you know, turn your attention to a couple of scriptures here. 18 to 20, we are going to read 18 to 20 again. Verse 18, and when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with Jesus. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, listen to me, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion over you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. I know this morning, I would like to title my sermon as Request Denied. Can you say that with me? Request denied. We saw an amazing conversation between the one who was possessed with the de demon and he got just delivered and the one who delivered him, Lord Jesus Christ. The one who was, who was delivered, he expressed his desire to be with the Lord Jesus. Amen? So he wanted to be with the Lord Jesus because he just got released out of the heavy burden that he was carrying, we don't know, for how many years together. And he expressed his desire to be with Jesus. Now this morning as we title our sermon said, saying, Drake was denied. And you know, I was just uh, thinking about what is going on here. Why that particular request was denied by Jesus? And what was wrong? You know, I was just, you know, my mind was just rolling around these scriptures. So this morning, we are just going to keep this conversation at the center. And we are going to ask a couple of questions. 
to find out what exactly is going on over there. And this man begged Jesus to be with him, but Jesus denied. Jesus said, no, you are not going to be with me. So a couple of questions, as I said, we are going to put forth and ask and find out what was the intention and why Jesus had to say no to him. Question number one, was there anything wrong in asking to be with Jesus? What do you say? What is, the answer? What is your answer? You say, there is nothing wrong. There is nothing wrong. We all would like to be with Jesus. There is nothing wrong. And Bible says, when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. And I want you to think about the condition of the man, the past condition of this particular man. Bible says he was possessed with an unclean spirit called legion. You know, in the Roman army, legion means 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. They are called legion. And this man, this man was possessed by these unclean spirits. And, you know, we also know that there were 2,000 swains. They went and fell into the ocean. So maybe more than 2,000, from somewhere from 3,000, 4,000 to 6,000 demons were possessing this particular man, this single man. You know, I was just, you know, trying to understand his situation and, you know, just, just try to be along with him and trying to understand what he was going through. Bible also says he had no cloth on him. You know, we read that from another gospel, Luke chapter 8, Bible says he had no cloth on him. Often he was bound with chains and shackles. And whenever he was bound with chains and shackles, he broke everything and he came out of it. Always, always in the day and night, he was in the mountains or in the tombs. I want you to imagine, I want you to think about his situation, the like, kind of life that he was living, screaming and you know, running everywhere into the city and running back to the mountain and living in the tombs. I don't know whether he was eating anything or not because he was totally possessed and controlled by these demons. And always he was crying out and he was scratching him, cutting himself with stones. You know, when you come across such people, we find that you no know, demons, they inflict the individual, the person on whom they reside. Most of the time they take control and they take authority over the individual on whom they, they reside. And when demons are residing in, in, in someone's life, you know, the life is going to be very miserable. You know, he will, he doesn't, or he or she doesn't know what she or he is supposed to do, are doing. But you know, they will just, they will be totally controlled and powered by the demons they are living inside of him. And certainly the body aches. Certainly they worry. Certainly their parents worry about it. You know, that's the reason Bible says we should not give room for the demon to enter into our lives. And a demon has various types of control over our lives. At times he controls from afar. We would not have been possessed by the demon, but then he has an authority, he has a control. The moment we open the door for him. That's the reason it's very important to be with the Lord, to walk with the Lord. Now we understand, trying to understand the condition of this man. We don't know how long he was living in the same condition. He was not just getting relieved out of his pain. Not getting relieved out of his oppression and shame and torment that everything he was going through in his life. And when Jesus released him out of the demons, there was a great comfort. There was a great love that flew into his life and he started experiencing the presence of the living God. Amen? Are you with us this morning? Amen? So now when he was standing in front of Jesus, when the demons went out of him, there was a great joy came in his life. He felt that, you know, the, the, uh, two tons of heaviness were taken out of his life. He became so free. You know, he never knew about, you know, what is real life. But the moment the demons went out of him, he felt it is so great to live on the face of this earth. You know, there are times in our lives, we, through, we go through such a difficult moment in, in, in our lives. When we are oppressed, when we are overburdened by so many things in our lives. You know, we may think that, Lord, is it the life all about? Is it the life that you have said that I will give you abandoned life? Is that the life that you are talking about in the word of God? Lord, I don't want to live anymore, Lord God. You know, we come to a conclusion when we are oppressed by the work of the devil. And this morning God is telling, when he was released, there was a great joy. For a moment, he, you know, he would have thought and he would have thought, where can I go back now? 
He did, obviously, he did not want to go back to the graveyard. He did not want to go there. And he had no courage to face the society. You know, you can imagine he would have made that amount of damage to everybody. And more than everything, now 2,000 swine were lost. And obviously, he did not want to get back to his society. What about his family? He, he was not sure where he can go. What about his family? His family is not going to accept him. You know, as far as his family is concerned, he is dead. He is gone for long ago. From long ago. He is no more because they were such a great shame. They were in such a deep shame. This man coming naked and running and running around and standing in front of their house. They did not want to see this. And this man had no place to go. When he thought about all this, there is only one who understood him. There is only one who came all the way from there seeking for this particular individual. And he came there and he released him out of his bondage. When he thought about all these things, he realized it's good to be with Jesus. It's good to be with Jesus. So he begged Jesus, Lord Jesus, I want to be with you. So I don't find anything wrong as you said. However, Bible says, Jesus denied this request. So my question number two is, why did Jesus reject his appeal? Why? Why did Jesus reject his appeal? You know, however, Bible says, Jesus did not permit him. Can you say that with me? Jesus did not permit him. Why? He is a new convert, obviously. And he needs church, like all of us need church. He needs to be part of the Jesus movement. And he needs to be taught by the Lord God. He needs all the teaching. Just only one encounter he had, just a few minutes ago. Maybe lasted for a few minutes. That's it. No Sunday morning service. No Sunday school. No fasting prayer. No Bible study. No revival meeting. No ministry training. Nothing. He did not have any of those things. Only one encounter that was supernatural. He just got released out of his bondage. Why did Jesus reject his appeal? Just thinking about a couple of things came in my mind. First of all, I believe he shouldn't become comfortable of being in the presence of God. Listen to me. He shouldn't become comfortable of being in the presence of God. You know, today when you think about our lives, we have the church of our own choice. We have our preferred timing, morning 7 o'clock, there is a service, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. It's all up to our preference. We have many choices around. We have our own preferred chair, even though our name is not written. Right? Yes? Now I keep seeing you, all of you, most of you sitting in the same place. Right? Thanks, God, for giving me that idea. <laughs> right? So we are so comfortable coming to church every morning and praising God and worshiping God and going back. And even at times, oh God, we know we come in the presence of God, we just make sure that songs are of our preference. And we even expect the message to be in just exciting, right? So we just want to get in, excited in the Lord. And we just want to get filled by the Holy, in the Holy Ghost. And just we want to go home blessed. And this man who wanted to be with Jesus, Jesus said, I don't want you to be with me and just comfort, get comfortable and just stay with me forever. The presence of God, you know, sometimes when we go after the service, we say, brother, the presence of God was so thick today. I really enjoyed the presence of God. God really touched me. God really blessed me. It's all good. You know, sometimes people come into the church like just like a movie theater. Go there and just two hours. I didn't even know what was going on. It was so exciting. The presence of God was so thick there. I did not even know. That's true actually. He did, never knew what was going on there inside the church. We just come out of this church so excited. And say, I don't really know how time just went. You know, this morning, I just want to talk to you a little bit about 
why Jesus denied his request. He did not want him to get comfortable with just by sitting inside the church. Secondly, I also thought about that the transformation looks like that took place inside of him was powerful. You know, no way he could contain the transformation that has just taken place inside of him. There is no way he can just keep that within himself. He had to go out really and share that with somebody. What he went through in his life was totally unimaginable. He never would have thought that such a release will come on his way. Such a life changing. The torment was totally taken out of his life. As he was released by the power of the living God. The transformation. The real transformed life can speak into lives. And speak into others lives. We also thought about this, the disciples, if you, you know, if you are with me this morning, the disciples were, listen to me, the disciples were called into the ministry. You remember Jesus going and telling Peter, you just follow me, follow me, follow me. Everybody were called into the, into the ministry. But this man, I would say he was delivered into the ministry. He was not just called like Peter and John and the other apostles. He was just delivered and put into the ministry. And God wanted him to go out. Not to just be with Jesus. I mean, it doesn't mean that you are walking away from Jesus. No, no, no. You are going to be with Jesus. But he's saying they're not inside the boat. Certainly not inside the boat. I believe that's the reason he did not permit. Jesus did not permit. My question number three is, why did Jesus ask him to minister to his own people. That was not an easy thing. Can you just think about you going, you know, some of our parents are still not Christians. Some of our parents are still, they worship the other gods and goddesses. At times it is very difficult to go back and tell them, share your testimony with your parents. You know, you may be okay with sharing with somebody else, someone who is not known to us. But when you want to do that in, the, in, your same, in your family, you have challenges. You have difficulties. But Jesus is saying, you need to go back to your own people and you know, minister to them. This is what Jesus said. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. And how he has had compassion over you. Go and tell them that what God has done to you. So Jesus did not allow him. To continue with him. And Jesus is asking him to go and minister to your own people. You know, it is good to be in the presence of God 24 by 7. Who doesn't want it? It's good to be in the presence of God. You know, those who are, those who are following God very closely. Some of us play instruments. If you just give one guitar in your hand, just sing songs and be in the presence of God. You may just really rejoicing be in the, being in the presence of God. But God said the number one priority is to tell others about Jesus. Amen. Are you with me this morning? The number one, what is the number one priority? The number one priority is to go out and tell others about Jesus. You know, our testimony is the most powerful weapon that we hold in our hands. You know, that's the reason we encourage you to come and share your testimony. And you know what? Being a small church, we have an option to come to the platform and, you know, look at the crowd and tell what God is doing in, in our lives. Our testimony is a very powerful, you know, weapon. The question is, do we have a testimony? Now, some of us, when we talk about, you know, we say that, oh, I don't have a you know, testimony. No, do we, you have a testimony. You may not have a dramatic experience of, of knowing the Lord because you were born in the, maybe in a Christian family, but you chose, you prefer to have Jesus as your Lord. And you see a transformation taking place inside of you. You know, that itself is a testimony. Our testimony is the most powerful weapon. Now, you know, think about this historical scenario. Now, Decapolis was a very challenging mission field. It was not an easy field there. You know, there we see the Greeks and the Romans and their culture was predominant in those days in, the, in, in that part of the land. And God is asking this man to go into his city. God is asking him to go into his city. And he is telling him, go home to your friends. You know what? They may deny Jesus. But they cannot deny the transformation that has recently taken place in his life. Are you with me? You know, they may, they may not like Jesus. 
But now they are going to see what really have had happened to this man. Nobody can deny. You know, that speaks to us this morning. People may not like Jesus. People may deny, but they can never deny your testimony because testimony is something that you experience in your life. When you share your testimony, nobody can deny because it is you. It's all about you. It is what you went through in your life. Nobody can deny. Testimony is powerful. You know, at any point of time, we should be willing to share our testimony to others. That is going to change lives around us. Amen. Question number four. What was the man's reaction? So Jesus said, you are not permitted. And then Jesus also said, you need to go back to your own place and share the gospel there. And now the question number four is, what was the man's reaction? And I was really amazed. The man who asked to be with Jesus when Jesus said, no, 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 you are not going to be with me. You are going to go out and preach the gospel. What was the reaction? The Bible says, and he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And all marveled. No questions asked. The moment Jesus said, you are going, that's it. No questions, no more questions. When his request was denied, and this man who was just released from the demon, oppression of the demon, he obeyed Jesus and he was willing. Amen? He was willing on the day. Mark chapter 16 verse 5 says, I want you to read this uh, scripture with me, all of us. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, all of you, loudly, out loud, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I believe it is a command. It is not just a counsel. It is a command. It is not an option or it is not a choice. Listen to me. It is our responsibility that we need to go into all the world. And what we should do? What should we do? We need to preach the gospel. Can you, can you, can you say that out loud? Preach the Every one of you, every one of you, I want to see your mouth moving. Every one of us. And we need to go out to the world and preach the gospel. So it is the command. It is the command. Mark chapter 13 verse 10. You know, Paul says, and the gospel must first be preached. You know, Jesus said, in fact, the gospel must be preached into all the nations. Jesus said, gospel must be preached. It is a command that gospel has to be preached. Paul says, you know, we talked about it last week. Telling the good news is my duty. Telling the good news is my duty. Something that I must do. There is no option. Something that I must do in my life. We must obey and be willing to share Christ to others. You know, it's, it, I don't know how, how, you know, how it works. You know, devil has put a fake picture in front of us saying that sharing the gospel belongs to some people, some individuals, those who are gifted. You know, I would say nobody is gifted. Nobody is gifted in a special way. The gift starts working in our lives when we start activating, when we start operating in those gifts. You know, sometimes we feel so shy to go out and share. Take a first step. Take a first step. You will realize, you will wonder God is using you. Because you know what? God has a plan for you. God has a purpose in all our lives. Amen. I believe this morning God may stir our hearts. So that we may obey his voice. Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. They met each other. As students. In the Wheaton College in Illinois. Jim was an young man. Whose heart was on fire for God. Even at this young age. And he somehow wanted to reach the unreached. And he was really, spirit, you know, spiritually, he was really inspired by several ministry, missionaries reading, by reading their biographies of several missionaries such as David Brainard, William Carey, and Amy Carmichael. And he was convinced so deeply inside of him that it is a responsibility on him to go out and share the love of Christ to somebody in some part of the globe. And you know what David, uh, Jim did? He also convinced his four friends, Nate Saint and Roger Uderin, Ed McCauley, and Pete Fleming. So four of his friends, they were totally convinced by Jim. Can we have the pictures? And Jim said, we are going to go 
as missionaries. I mean, it's not a story, it's just a story which happened uh, 70 years before, not very long ago. So four of these friends, they were totally convinced by Jim as well as by the Spirit of God. They want to go into the mission field. And they decided they want to go and, you know, and minister to the Okoy Indians, those who are living in Kure River in Ecuador. So they make this decision in 1956, not very far. They made the strong decisions. We are going to there, going to go there, and we are going to minister in Ecuador. On January 8, 1956, the missionaries decided to go there immediately to the Akos mission land, mission field, and they wanted to see whether they are welcoming them. And they flew their plane over that field and they started throwing some gifts and see whether how they respond. Those, you know, they have never seen an airplane and they have never seen such a people in their lives. So it looks like the response was good and they were coming and collecting all the gifts were, that, that were thrown. And when they landed there, they landed in the beach and they wanted to have their first crusade there in the beach. And they, these four friends, five of them, they were just ready to go and minister to that people. And as they were walking, suddenly they saw a movement inside the bush. And the birds were flying out of the trees. Now, later, when the rescue team was sent there to particular, that particular island upon arriving the beach, they found the plane has been totally stripped of all its fabrics and the wings were damaged, totally destroyed. And soon they found one, two, three and four bodies lying in the water with spears embedded from the back. And they also found the fifth body that was of Ed McCauley's body. They did not do anything. They never spoke a word to anybody in that island. Nothing happened. The whole world, if you read the history, if you Google, and the whole world was saying that it is a foolish thing to go and die at this young age in this type of situation. The five missionaries had been killed in their first attempt to reach the indigenous tribe in Ecuador. All five missionaries died as a martyr in the tribal land. Now later, Jim Elliot's wife, Elizabeth Elliot, and her three-year-old daughter, Valerie, and Rachel Saint, wife of another person there, they went to the same place where their husbands were killed. And they started, Elizabeth started sharing the gospel. People over there, they looked at the forgiveness of this woman of God. They looked at the, the, the compassion and the acceptance that this woman of God had over the tribal land as he was, as this lady, listen to me, as Elizabeth was ministering to the people over there. Their lives continue to impact people of Ecuador and the whole tribal community came to the Lord. Amen? The whole tribal community came to the Lord. And at times it was questioned why they had to go there and die. But the blood of the martyr speaks. The blood of the martyr. You know, today some of us are, you know, are in Christian faith because a missionary came to our land. And he gave us life. He died and he bled on that land. And you know what? People raised. From nowhere God started adding people into his kingdom. You know, their lives continue to impact countless Christians and non-Christians on the face of this earth today. And draw them closer to God. Now, I just want to close with a couple of words they shared in all these five guys. And Elizabeth wrote a beautiful book. The book is still in, in, available in Amazon. It's named as Through Gates of Splendor. It's an amazing book. Through Gates of Splendor. Now, in her book, she quoted the commitments and the obedience of these five men of God. Now, just want to, in a quote, just want to throw those quotes that, you know, the words that are spoken by these five individuals. Pete Fleming says, a call, this is what Pete Fleming says, one of those who died. A call is nothing more nor less than obedience to the will of God. You know, at times we wait and wait and wait and we say that, I'm not called. 
You know, we fool ourselves at times when we say that I'm not called to do this. I'm not called to do this. Look at the way, you know, he puts that call of God. A call is nothing more, nothing less than obedience to the will of God. We know that gospel must be preached to every creature. That is the will of God. That is the will of God. And we fool ourselves at times saying that, no, 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 no. I am not called. I am not called. A call is nothing more or nothing less, not less than obedience to the will of God as God presses it home to the soul by whatever means he chooses. The missionary pilot, Nate Saint, he described his commitment to follow Christ when he wrote this. He says, I am concerned about safety. He's a pilot. But I don't let it keep me from getting on with God's business. Every time I take off, I'm ready to deliver up the life I owe to God. You know, the life that we hold today, it doesn't really belong to us. We owe that life back to God. It doesn't matter when today or tomorrow or in the future, whenever it may be. We owe that to God. That life has to go back to God. We don't own it. And Ed McCauley wrote back to his parents after reaching Ecuador, you know, this is what Ed wrote. I praise God for bringing us to this land to work with these people. I pray that we might be faithful to our calling and that God will use us to bring many of these Indians to himself. It was his desire. It got accomplished. Not the way Ed McCauley liked you know, at times, not the way things may not work out the way we like, but God wants that willing soul to go there and die in that land so that people will follow God. Jim Elliot gets all this right in his heart, following God. And, you know, he surrendered himself as he wrote this word. He is no fool. He gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool. You know, sometimes we think that, you know, they are just fools. They are going into the foreign land and dying. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Here are the five missionaries. All that they did in their lives, they just simply obeyed the call of God. Shall we all stand for a moment this morning before we close?